If you will, let's open our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Uh, we'll start in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 tonight. And then kind of jump around a little bit in the book of Proverbs. We're talking about the wisdom of Solomon, and we've had a couple of lessons uh, concerning that idea. One, our first kind of introduced the idea of wisdom and the book of Proverbs and what it was about. Our last lesson, we talked about the the wisdom of true wisdom uh, that comes from God has to start with the fear of the Lord and having a proper reverence and respect for Jehovah. Tonight, we're going to look at a second thing that is key to having true wisdom, and that is respect for parents. And so we're going to talk about the home a little bit and about our responsibilities toward one another in the home as God has uh, uh, taught us those things and hopefully learn some lessons about wisdom that relate to that from the book of Proverbs. So the world that we live in today tells us that the home can really just be anything that it wants to be. Uh, Women don't need men and men don't need women. We can all, you know, take care of ourselves and do whatever we want on our own. And so the idea of a traditional family, a nuclear family, as it used to be called, it's kind of thrown out the window. Uh, God has a different idea about that, however. The world tells us that one parent is just as good as having two parents, or maybe you want to have three or four, whatever. Uh, And we understand that sometimes there are situations that arise where single-parent homes, you know, happen, and, and, you know, it's a part of the world that we live in. A spouse may die there or divorce and things of that nature for scriptural reasons. Uh, But that doesn't mean that that's the best scenario. You can raise godly children in a single parent home, uh, but it's not without work and without its own struggles and sacrifices and labors. Um, it It can be done, but God's ideal, one man and one woman as husband and wife, a father and a mother, is the best arrangement for the home. And not only does the Bible teach that, but history bears it out. And honest scientists and psychologists and all of those things will say the same thing as well. The world, our, the world today tells us you can have two fathers or two mothers and that home will be just as fine as uh, a traditional family. But again, we have to remember that the world's standard for the home, the world's goals for the home are very different than those who follow God. And they're very different than God's goals for the home. So their goals may be focused, you know, on material wealth or on education or or on whatever, social justice. God's focus is on salvation. His focus is on spiritual lives and and, uh, morality and ultimately being with him forever in heaven. And the way to accomplish that, the best way, the most stable way, is his plan and his pattern for the home a father and a mother who are bringing up children. So God tells us in his world, in his word rather, that in our world, children need the love and the support and the guidance of both a father and a mother. And that goes all the way back to Genesis 2 when God created Adam and Eve. That was deliberate and with a purpose. And he instituted marriage when he joined them together. And the rule that man would leave father and mother and be joined to his wife and they when they had children would become father and mother and that was God's arrangement so the Ten Commandments Exodus 20 and verse 12 tells us to honor thy father and thy mother repeated in Deuteronomy 5 and all the way down to the New Testament in Ephesians 6 1 through 4 which we're going to study later on it's always a father and a mother that's God's plan and that's the best way and again, that doesn't mean that there can't be you know, exceptions due to situations that we have to work with, but it's the best way, and, and it's ultimately what God desires for the home. So in relation to that, the book of Proverbs, Solomon has a lot to say about this uh, relationship between parents and children and how that relates to wisdom, to being wise, to understanding who we are, and our place and our position in the world and, of course, in respect to God, and how to make right decisions, the best decisions that will give us the the best, the most secure, the most uh, prosperous, especially spiritually prosperous life in this world and prepare us for eternity. And that's the kind of wisdom that we ought to be seeking. 
So we're going to talk just briefly about the responsibilities of parents and the duties of children, just as kind of foundation. And then we're going to go into the book of Proverbs and look at what Solomon says uh, about these things. So Proverbs 1, verses 8 and 9, he says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. And so the idea is that if you'll listen to what your parents teach you, what your father says and what your mother says, and abide by their guidance and their instruction, and the understanding is that they are godly parents, they're trying to do what is right and to lead their children in the right way, if we listen to them, then we'll be blessed. An ornament of grace, he says, to your head, chains about thy neck. It's the idea of being uh, well-ordered and and beautifully presented in the world and especially spiritually but it's tied directly to listening to father and mother i think we mentioned this in our last lesson but the book of proverbs begins with instruction from a father to a son and it ends in chapter 31 with instruction from a mother to her son and i think it's 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 fascinating you know that passage in proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman that we so often you know, read at funerals uh, for godly women, those words about a virtuous woman were given by a mother to her son. This is the kind of woman that you're looking for in a wife. This is the kind of woman she had tried to be herself. And so that instruction comes from a woman who had passed it down to her son who has written it now uh, by inspiration in, in Scripture. So the book of Proverbs starts and ends with father and mother instructing children how to be wise and to have wisdom. So it is the responsibility of parents to instruct their children. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. The instruction there, the command to parents is, the responsibility is to train up the child, to bring him up. Uh, and the Ephesians writer, Paul, says to do that in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that's what Solomon's talking about in Proverbs as well, and also in harmony with the child's disposition and abilities and talents and those things. But it reminds us that parents have the responsibility of teaching and of training their children. Now, we hear oftentimes about how the church is losing her children, The church is losing her young people. The truth of the matter is the church doesn't have any young people. The church doesn't have children. Parents have children. And that doesn't mean that churches don't have responsibilities in teaching the Bible and so forth, but ultimately it's the responsibility of father and mother to bring up their children in the knowledge of God's word. So the church doesn't lose its children. Uh, They can. Churches can have an influence uh, in a negative way. But ultimately, the responsibility comes back to the home for the training and the teaching of children. That means, of course, that parents have to um, teach them the will of God. It's not just training them, you know, in how to be a good student, though that's part of their upbringing. But what we're talking about spiritually here, of course, and with wisdom, is bringing children up in the knowledge of God and of responsibility in relation to him and of course the truth of his word so we know that passage from deuteronomy um, chapter six i'm going to read just a few verses of it to to remind us it says now these are the commandments the statutes and the judgments which the lord your god commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it and he says that you might uh, fear the lord thy god to keep all his statutes and his commandments which i command thee Thou and thy son and thy son's son all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. So you teach it to your children and to your children's children. And then he gives those instructions. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. 
And so parents have to have God's word in their hearts and in their minds and then diligently teach them to their children. And you notice there that it's not take them to Bible school once a week or twice a week, but it's on a daily basis you're teaching them God's word and talking to them about God's word and it's the walls of your house and it's the, you know, when you go to bed at night and when you wake up in the morning, it's a continual and, and a serious responsibility for parents to teach children. So it has to start with their knowing God's will and then instructing their children. Again, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, if we don't know what the Lord says, we can't bring our children up in that knowledge. So parents have the responsibility to teach children God's will. And in order to do that, they have to know the word of God. If you look over at Proverbs 3 and verse 1, Solomon says something interesting here to his son. And of course, he's writing by inspiration. But he says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Now, earlier... He's encouraging him to remember God's law, but now he says, my law and my commandments. And it doesn't mean that it's not God's. It is. But the idea is that Solomon was supposed to take God's law and commandments and make them his own by knowing them and living them in his life so that when his children followed his law and his commandments, they would actually be following God's law and God's commandments. So God's word became Solomon's word because he learned it and he lived it and set an example for his children as he taught them God's will. So God's word is supposed to become so uh, important to us and such a part of us that our living becomes an example of him and of his word. And of course, we understand that from the New Testament that we let Christ, uh, he dwells in us, and as we live, we magnify him. And that needs to be true in the home as well. So parents have to know God's word, and then they have to keep God's word. Not just teach it to their children, but live it before their children so they see the example of one living according to the truth of Scripture. And we need to think seriously about, you know, that, that principle. I was just thinking, it's prom time, and I've been seeing a lot of pictures of Christian families who are dressing their daughters up in dresses that they wouldn't let them wear to worship service. But you know, because it's prom, for some reason, it, it seems like it's okay. We forget that Galatians 5 is in the Bible sometimes when it comes to, to prom. Or, you know, it's important to attend worship services faithfully unless there's a sporting event. And then that becomes more important. It's important to dress appropriately and, and to act correctly unless we go on vacation. And then we have like these different rules somehow. That's not parents bringing up their children in, in the instruction of the Lord. You know, a preacher can preach on those things over and over again. And some children may hear it and, and may learn it and, and may abide by it. But when they go home and it's taught differently or it's demonstrated differently, you know, than what the Bible says, nine times out of ten, children are going to follow the example that they've seen in the home than what they've heard in Bible class or in a sermon or even sometimes read in Scripture. Now, that doesn't excuse them as they grow older, but it reminds us of our responsibility as parents. And we must never underestimate the power of, of that kind of influence of godly parents. We talked about uh, Abraham not too long ago in Genesis uh, 18 and verse 19 when God told him you know, what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. He said the reason why God said, I know him, that he will command his children after him. And we talked about how that didn't just mean he was going to teach Isaac, but his influence for good would extend through generations. That's a godly influence of a parent who didn't just teach God's word, but he, he lived it. There's a great example in Jeremiah chapter 35 and verse 13. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? So God says, Won't you listen to me? And then he gives this example. 
He says the words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine are performed. For unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. So God says, here's a man uh, named Jonadab, and he gave an instruction to his family to be passed on to his family members not to drink. And God says, to this day, they still don't drink alcohol. When God says to this day, Jonadab lived 300 years before this statement was made about him. Now, think about 300 years ago. What, 1721? Any of us know who our ancestors were back then? Most, we probably have no idea who, who our forefathers were from those days. But this man's influence was so great that for 300 years his entire family had abstained from, from alcohol because of his example. And by the way, it wasn't because he did some kind of study to find out that it had negative health effects or whatever. It's because God said so. God said, don't drink, and he said, we're going to follow God, and for over 300 years, they didn't. And God uses that as an example to his children, and he says, you know, I'm right here through Jeremiah trying to tell you my will, and you won't even listen. But the point is, there, there is power in a godly influence of parents to their children, and they pass it on to their children, and so on and so on. We need to remember that kind of influence. So our responsibility as parents is to teach, to train, to bring up our children according to God's will. What about the duties of children? Well, Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So children have the duty to obey their parents. And then, of course, verse 2 uh, quotes from the Ten Commandments, uh, and it says, Honor your father and mother, thy father and mother. Uh, for this is the first commandment with promise. And the promise in the Ten Commandments was that they would um, inherit the land and prosper in it. So it was a commandment that had uh, a promise attached to it, that if you honor your father and mother, there will be blessing and you will inherit the land of Canaan and you will be blessed and, and prosperous in it. And that's a principle that's going to come up over and over again uh, in the book of Proverbs, that when you listen to what your parents tell you and you do what they say, your life is better than if you don't. And it's, uh, it's just the way the world works when parents are teaching us the truth and leading us in a godly way. When we heed their advice, our lives are better than if we don't. We avoid so many negative things and, and, and obstacles and trouble that can you know, put us on the wrong path. So children have a responsibility to obey their parents and to honor their parents, which means to respect them and to treat them with the proper uh, reverence that they deserve simply because uh, they're your parents. Um, they brought you into the world, so they have authority over you, and they're trying to lead you according to God's will, and so they deserve honor and, and respect. And all children you know, have that responsibility. Now, it has to be taught when we're young, but as we grow older, it's something that we have to start doing on our own. And the thing we need to remember in connection with this is that the choice is always an individual one. And I want us to go over to Proverbs 10, and we're going to kind of jump around in these last few chapters and notice some things that are said in the book of Proverbs about choosing to listen to your parents and obey your parents or choosing not to. And think about these words. So Proverbs 10 and verse 1, first of all, says, uh, of course, the Proverbs of Solomon, so this is a new section of the book, but Solomon wrote these. He says, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. And so the thing we notice here is there's a choice. You're a son, either way, you have to choose if you're going to be a wise son or a foolish son. If you choose to be foolish, it's going to be a heaviness to your mother. She's going to worry about you. She's going to cry herself to sleep at night and all those things. But if you're a wise son, then your parents will be glad. Your father will be glad. They'll be proud of you. But the point is, we have to make that choice. It's up to us to choose. No one can force us to be wise or to be foolish. We make those decisions. When you look in chapter 13 and verse 1, he says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction but a scorner heareth not rebuke. 
So here again, we have a choice. Our parents try to teach us and instruct us. If we're wise, we'll listen. But then he talks about a scorner. This is a, a person, uh, he says here, who heareth not rebuke. So one who mocks things that are holy or things that are right, uh, who, who doesn't have any respect for those things that he should have respect for, not only will he not listen to his parents when they try to teach him, but when he gets into trouble and he needs to be corrected so he can do better, he won't even listen to the rebuke. He's only going to go further and further into trouble. So you can go in that direction or you can be wise and go in the right direction, but the choice is up to us. Chapter 15 and verse 5 tells us this. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Prudent is wise. So we can listen to what our parents say and be wise, or we can despise it and we'll prove ourselves foolish. Verse 20 of this chapter says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. You know, it's funny, all these, um, you know, like country songs about, about mama and, you know, mama tried and all those things. Uh, these men who have gone the wrong direction claim that they love their mothers, but the Bible says you don't. You don't love her. You despise her if you've brought all this heartache upon her by the decisions that you've made. Make the right choices, and that's not a problem. We look in chapter 17 in verse number 6. Solomon tells us this. Children's children are the crown of old men. And we usually, when we read that verse, we, it seems like we always stop there because everybody wants to talk about their grandkids, right? Children's children are the crown of old men. But the last part of that verse says, the glory of children are their fathers. You think about a little child looking up to his father, and, and he sees him as Superman. You know, he's the greatest hero. My dad's better than your dad. That's the idea here. And, and the principle is how... As we grow older and have grandchildren, the way we think about them is how when we're children, we think about our parents. And so parents need to recognize that kind of hero position they have to their children uh, and act accordingly and teach them accordingly. But if you notice also in this chapter at verse 21, he says, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. Now he says begetteth a fool, that doesn't mean that people are born foolish um, we choose to go in that direction but the point is that if our son turns out to to choose to live that way then it's sorrowful it's not joyful but sorrowful as we have to watch their life you know go in the wrong direction the father of a fool has no joy and then verse 25 he says a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him again the choice is up to us chapter 19 and verse 13 a foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the conditions of a wife are a continual, I'm sorry, the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. Uh, so the foolish son is the calamity of his father. It even takes it a step further. But look at verse 26 of this chapter. He says, He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame and bringeth reproach. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the world, uh, words of knowledge. An ungodly witness scorneth judgment, and the mouth of the wicked devoureth iniquity. Judgments are prepared for scorners, and stripes for the back of fools. So he says a person who rejects his, his father and mother and their advice, um, he causes shame and he brings reproach. And then he tells us this is often why that happens, because they're listening to the wrong people. Instead of listening to their parents who love them and are trying to you know, teach them the best and lead them in the right way, they listen to those who lead people away from knowledge, away from truth, away from wisdom. And the end of that road, he says, is judgment, prison, and stripes for the back of fools, punishment. So again, the choice is ours, but we get to see the, the direction that, uh, that we're headed. Chapter 23 then, in verse 22, says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding, 
The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. The father and uh, thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Then he says, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. So the father says, Look at me, watch how I live, learn from my example, and give me your heart. Be devoted to, to your father because of his love and because of the wisdom that he's trying to impart uh, to you. So you notice here he talks about begetting a wise son. Again, it doesn't mean he's born that way, but he chooses uh, that direction. And then two more verses, chapter 28 and uh, verse 7 says, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. And then chapter 30 and verse 11 there is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And we can say amen to that, I believe. We see that so many times uh, in the world that we live in. So the principle here that we're being shown is that you can be wise or you can be foolish. You can listen to your parents or not listen to your parents. You can study God's word or not study God's word. We all have that choice. The decision is ours. But what Solomon is showing us is that wisdom is to understand, first of all, that God loves us and he wants what is best for us. And that's why he gives us his word and tells us right from wrong and, and all of those things. And secondly, our parents love us and they want what is best for us. And that's why they teach us God's word and why they tell us right from wrong and why they punish us when we do wrong and discipline us and teach us responsibility and make us clean our room and, and all of those things, not because you know they, they're trying to be mean, make life miserable, but they're trying to bring us up in the way that's going to give us the best life here and more than that, eternal life in heaven. Now, all of that is, is available, but the choice is ours. And depending upon what we choose, of course, we will have consequences. And I want to read some of these just real quick before we look at our last point. Proverbs 17 and verse 2 says, A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame, and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. So a son who causes shame, as we've seen, is a son who doesn't listen to his father. He listens to the wrong people. He goes in the wrong direction. He does the wrong things. Solomon says uh, a wise man, a wise servant of God, will rule over him. That is, while he's under his authority, he's going to bring him back into line. By discipline is, is what he's talking about. Okay, So go over to chapter 28 again and verse number 24. 28, 24 says, Whoso robbeth his father or his mother and saith, it is no transgression, the same is the companion of a destroyer. So if we don't listen to our parents... They'll discipline us. We may be punished in, in whatever way. Now we find out that if we don't heed their, their warnings, if we are not changed by their discipline, that we can become a person who robs father or mother and says there's nothing wrong with it. We become a companion of the destroyer. You remember that Jesus talked uh, to the Pharisees about how they claimed to follow God's law, to honor their father and their mother, Yet, when their parents were in their old age, instead of taking care of them, they took that money and they declared it Corban, which means they dedicated it to the Lord and to the temple. And it was really a money laundering scheme. They, they gave it to the temple and the temple gave it back to them. So technically, they said, they didn't have to use it to help their parents. They were robbing their fathers and their mothers of what was justly theirs because it was the responsibility of their children to honor their parents. Yet they said it's no transgression. What Jesus said to them, what the wise man said here, they were companions of the destroyer. They might as well have been, you know, murdering their parents. They might as well have been, you know, going around creating chaos because they had the same attitude as a thief and a robber and, and a murderer. And that's the principle here, that if we don't listen to what our parents say, then we become companions of, of the devil, of evil, of those who, who do evil, and we're just as bad as they are. Chapter 29 and verse 15, he says it this way, 
The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother shame. And we don't like that verse sometimes, but it's true that one of the ways to get wisdom, if we won't listen to God, we won't be wise and, and accept what God says and submit to his will, sometimes it, it has to be beaten into us by our parents or sometimes even God allows us to be disciplined and we go through difficult situations to learn lessons the hard way. Think about the prodigal son and everything that he endured. It was his choice, his decision, because he wouldn't listen to wisdom of his father. He had to learn it the hard way, and it was a very difficult road that he walked. That's the principle that's being taught here. And then chapter 30 and verse 17 says, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. And so the final end is, uh, you know, a shameful uh, death uh, and destruction that takes place here. So it's a picture of someone who, who has been killed and just left out uh, into the wild. How did, how did he ever get there into this situation? Well, it started when he refused to listen to God and he refused to listen to his parents. And sadly, we see it over and over uh, in our world and even in, in our own families. We make the choice, but we have to understand there are consequences. So as children, when the Bible teaches us to obey and to honor our parents, it's not just because God you know, wants us to do that for no reason. It's because there are consequences to not following wisdom, to not obeying our parents, and they always lead us to a place we don't want to go, a place of hardship and of suffering and ultimately of, of death and even eternal death where we're separated from God. So let's go back to chapter 1, and we're not going to take the time to read all these passages, of course. There, there's so many things in these first chapters. But in chapters 1 through 7, Solomon talks as a father to his son. And think about it in, in two ways, and there are even some places where he talks about his father talking to him. And, you know, we have the record in Scripture from... Uh, passages there, First Kings and First Chronicles, where David gave instruction to Solomon. And we can see that Solomon appreciated that and, and he understood it. And at least in his early years, he, he lived by it. So that's partly what, what he's talking about here. But ultimately, he's also talking as a father to his children and especially to his son, Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the man who's supposed to be king after Solomon and the very reason that the kingdom of Israel divides into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom is because Rehoboam didn't listen to the words of the book of Proverbs there are things that Solomon says in here that if he had just lived by and acted according to these instructions he never would have listened to the wrong people he never would have raised the taxes he never would have done those things that finally split the kingdom apart but he rejected that wisdom and the kingdom divided and you know the rest of the history is um, heartbreaking for the nation of Israel so the instructions here apply directly to Solomon's son and we get to see the results of him not listening to his father but I want to notice a few things with you that he as a father teaches his his son and his children the first thing that we read in verses 8 and 9 is to pay attention from a young age, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. And then he tells them, these are the blessings that will come. They shall be an ornament of grace into thy head, and chains about thy neck. So from a young age, we need to be teaching our children, and teaching them to listen. And then as they grow older, uh, they must make the choice and the decision to listen, and to heed the words of their parents. So it starts at the home influencing our children when you know we're their only influence in so many ways before they go out into the world uh, with school and then of course uh, as we grow older peer pressure and those things that's where verse 10 comes in verse 10 through verse 19 talks about choosing our friends and we we'll just read a few verses but he says my son if sinners entice thee consent thou not 
If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. And so they're wanting to rob people and, and take their money. Uh, and so if someone's enticing you to do something that is wrong, do something that is sinful, he says, don't consent. The lesson is choose friends carefully because our parents have a greatest influence on us, but as we grow older, we start to be influenced by our friends, by our peers. And in many ways, their influence can become greater uh, even than our parents, at least for a time in our lives. We usually grow out of that, but for a time, it's uh, you know one of the most powerful influences that we have. Solomon says, wisdom is to be careful who you allow to have influence over you. And, and he's warning him about those who would lead him into crime and, uh, and to sinful things. You come down to verse 20 then, and he says this, Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the or opening of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So he personifies wisdom as, as a person crying out in the streets, going from the marketplace through the, the town, anywhere that he can, crying out to people, here's wisdom. It, it's right here. All you have to do is come and take it. But we as people often choose what he calls simplicity here. That is to do our own thing, to follow our own will, instead of actually finding the truth and the wisdom that comes from God. Wisdom says in verse 24, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would not of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. So wisdom says, I tried and you wouldn't listen. Now when you reap the consequences of your actions and your decisions, I'm going to laugh. Because you could have avoided all of this if you just sought wisdom and truth. And so Solomon is telling his son, listen to the truth and listen to wisdom. It cries out. It's available. God has, has made it known to us. We just have to open our ears and our minds to it. And we can avoid, you know, the terrible consequences of not doing that. We come to chapter 2 then, and he says, not only should we pay attention, listen closely to wisdom, but you have to work for it. Work for truth and wisdom. He says, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up the voice, thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. It's there. It's available, but you have to work for it. You have to dig deeply, and so you have to seek it out, and you have to cry after it, and you have to pursue it and run it down and dig it up, and wherever it is, you have to look for it and find it. But it's worth the effort because of the blessings that it brings. So Solomon wants his son to know that wisdom is available. You have to listen to it, and you have to work for it. But it's worth all the effort. And then in verse 10, after you find it, you have to apply it. Notice what he says here. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. And, and he goes on. But he says, when wisdom comes into your heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto your soul. So you not only have it, but now you've taken it in, and, and it's what is pleasant to you. It's what brings you joy. You love truth, and you love wisdom, and so you hold on to it, and you apply it, and you live it uh, in your life. It's going to lead you in the right direction. Chapters 3 and 4 talk about remembering truth and wisdom, that after you, you learn it and you apply it, then don't forget what you've learned. 
Solomon needed to read these chapters to himself as he grew older in his life because he knew these things, but he forgot them or he willingly forgot them in order to live his life of, of, of sin and wastefulness and all those you know, things that he did. He says in verse 1 of chapter 3, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. And all through those chapters, he's talking about remembering it and holding on to it. So we, we learn it, and then we have to keep relearning it and bringing it back to our memory. We come to chapter 5, and he says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. And then he talks about, uh, verse 3, the lips of a strange woman drop as honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. And what he pictures here is that when you have wisdom, there are going to be those in the world who are going to try to tempt you away from it. And you have to be ready to defend yourself against that and defend the truth and, and wisdom. And so he pictures it as a woman trying to seduce a man. And he says you have to be on guard against that. In, in the literal sense, but also in protecting the wisdom that you've gained. Chapter 6 is about living according to wisdom. And it's all about daily living. Notice some of the things he says. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thine hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. If you co-sign a loan for somebody, you're on the hook. He's saying, that's not wisdom, don't do it. So you learn these principles, and then you have to live by them. Uh, he says uh, in verse 4, Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a, a roe or a deer from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. If you've joined in someone in this business arrangement and you owe money or whatever, get out of it as quickly as you can. Don't sleep until you're out of that situation. That's wisdom. Verse 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. So learn from the ant about preparing for the future. And on and on it goes, all these simple principles, yet they're wisdom. So it's taking these things that we've learned from God and, and from our parents about living you know, a good and godly life, applying them to our lives, and then seeing how they they play out in our daily interactions. And so not just know what we ought to do, but actually, you know, do it. And then chapter 7 is to have respect for, for truth and for wisdom. He says in verse 1, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live, and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from uh, the strange woman, from the stranger with flat, which flattereth with her words. Now, notice two things here. He says that call wisdom your sister and, and your kinswoman. And so what Solomon does in this chapter is to present um, two kinds of women. One is a woman that you respect as though she were your sister or your aunt or your cousin or, or whatever family member and the other is the woman who is a seductress basically uh, a prostitute and he describes how men are enticed by her allurements and they go in and to her and they end up destroying their reputations and destroying their lives and ultimately verse 27 going down to the chambers of death and that is true what he's talking about with with the strange woman there and he's warning against doing that but he's also saying presenting this uh, contrast with how we look at wisdom we need to view it as something that is deserving of our respect like a sister so we're going to do everything that we can to protect it to take care of it to nurture it when we have God's truth you know he says buy the truth and sell it not when we have acquired the truth of God it needs to be as close to us as a family member that we would do anything we would die to protect and to defend that's how important God's word and his wisdom is 
So don't treat it like, you know, a, a scarlet woman that you don't have any respect for, but like, like a, a, a kinsman, a, a, a dear, close family member. Hold on to it and, and protect it with your life because it is your life. That's the power of the word of God. So Solomon, as a father, is telling his son, and by doing so, of course, telling us just how important wisdom is. And in seeing the way he describes it and, and goes through talking about these things, it helps us to understand how to live a life that is pleasing to God, that will bring us salvation, will bring us spiritual blessings, also the material blessings that, that come from God, but ultimately eternal life in heaven. We have to see God's word for the power that it is and the importance that it is and the wisdom that comes from it is, is more important than anything else. And one of the ways that we learn that principle is when we're little children and our parents begin teaching us from a young age, this is what is truly important in life. And this is why this decision will lead you astray. This is why if you care more about money you know, than your soul, you're going to end up miserable and, and lost. We have to teach those lessons to our children, and they have to learn that those are more precious than, than anything else. And that's the wisdom that comes from Solomon. And it starts with fearing the Lord, and then it's followed up with having this respect and honor for our parents. So parents do the right thing and children learn from that, respect them, and they will be headed in the right direction in, in life and ultimately, of course, to eternal life. So it reminds us of the tremendous responsibilities that we have both as parents and as children and all of us as children of God to look to his word and the guidance that he gives us as a father to his children because of his love for us. We must learn to respect authority, and it starts in the home, and that's what Solomon is, uh, is teaching us. He had to learn it in his home, and now he's teaching it to his children, and all of us have to do the same in our homes, and that helps us to understand how to respect God. So it's necessary and essential to gaining true wisdom. So I hope we'll think about it and think about the important lessons that Solomon teaches us here and about our responsibilities to one another and especially as children of God, that we will truly honor and reverence him and his word uh, by the truth and sell it not. Not let anything come between us and the truth of scripture. Not just to know it, but to live it in our daily lives. It may be the case that as we look at things like this, we may consider our own lives and realize that we haven't been living according to the truth. We haven't been following wisdom. We've been foolish in our decisions and we're headed in the wrong direction and we know where that ends. It ends in punishment, which will be eternal if we don't turn around and make it right. Maybe someone here tonight needs to do that in a public way, to turn away from your sins and to give your life to the Lord or back to the Lord so that your sins can be forgiven. You can live by wisdom and know that heaven will be your home. If you need to become a Christian, God commands us to hear his word, to believe in Jesus, repent of our sins, confess the name of Christ, and to be baptized for the remission of sins. We can help you do that. If you've done that but have gone astray, you come back home to him through repentance of sin, confession of it, prayer for forgiveness. God promises to hear and answer with forgiveness and restoration. And then as we live by his wisdom, we know that heaven will be our eternal home. If you need to do that, we can help you in any way. We encourage you to think seriously about it, make that decision, and come responding, even now as we stand and as we sing. Sunday.